Let us bow our heads. Our dear Father, ask that you would speak to us, that we would hear your voice and answer your call and obey what you want us to do. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we return or continue our focus on the book of Revelation. This is a book for our time. Last time we looked at the God's call to his end time people to worship and obedience. And we saw that this remnant people, God's end time people, in the book of Revelation, they are identified as those who keep God's commandments. And they are loyal in their worship of God. And we especially saw that those who are faithful in the end times in the book of Revelation, that they show their loyalty to their to God, the true God, the creator God, by keeping the genuine Bible Sabbath holy. And this is in contrast to the vast majority of the world that are worshiping the beast and who eventually receive his mark. Today, we're going to look at part three of our series, The Call Out of Babylon. And so we see in the book of Revelation, and we're going to read that here just shortly, we see that there are, there is a profound and very significant call given in the book of Revelation. It is a most urgent appeal. In fact, it is the most urgent appeal in the entire Bible. And so we're going to look at that here shortly. But first, let's get some background before we read this call. Let's go with, if you would go with me over to the book of Revelation, chapter 14 and verse 8. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8. We're going to look at some context before we read the call. Revelation 14, verse 8. We're right in the middle of the three angels' messages here in this verse. This is the second angel. Revelation 14, verse 8 says, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This important message is going out to the entire world. This angel is represented as carrying this message, this end time message, out to the world. And he has an announcement to make. He says, Babylon is fallen. And not only is it fallen, but it's fallen twice. Really emphasizing the fact that it is fallen. And it says, that great city. Now, do you think... That in the end times, that, that this is talking about the literal city of Babylon that is fallen. Does that make any relevance? Does that seem relevant to you today? No. Do we know of any city named Babylon in this earth right today that's in existence? That um, I'm sure there probably are some, some towns named Babylon. I, I'm, I don't know of any, but <laughs> have you ever seen any? Been to any towns named Babylon? Perhaps you have it. But uh, this is not talking about some small town that's named Babylon. This is talking about a city. It says a great city. And uh, but if you look on the if you look on the world scene today, is there a great city, Babylon, in existence? Literally, no. So this is a symbolic, just like a lot of Revelation. It is symbolic of something. So we have to decipher what it symbolizes, okay? Well, whatever it is, it is a failed system. Now, do you like to be part of a failed system? No. Uh, it, it, it's not a good idea to stay with a failed system. This one, it says, is fallen, is fallen. And it gives a reason why. It says, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. 
Now let's get some more clues as to what this is talking about. Let's go over to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation 17, beginning in verse 1. What is Babylon? What is Babylon and what does it represent in the book of Revelation? We need to identify this because it is relevant for you and me today. Revelation 17, beginning in verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the, unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. All right, so let's see here. What's going on? John is relating this to us, and the angel comes to John and says, Come, follow, come, come with me. I'm going to show you the judgment of the great horror. And whoever this great horror is, she sits on many waters. What, what is that all about? Sitting on many waters. Okay, let's tuck that away in your memory. Come back to that. Verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Verse 3, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a what? A woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name. Oh, okay, so we get a name here written. And what is that name? Mystery, Babylon the Great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. So picture John here. He's looking at this scene in vision, and it must have really impressed him. He said it, it, it really impressed him. He just was surprised to see this, this picture of this woman, this harlot woman, and her name was Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. So she's a mother, and she has apparently has daughters who have followed in her same profession. All right, let's drop down to verse 15 to get some more clues here. Verse 15 of chapter 17. The angel is still explaining the vision. Verse 15, it says, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Okay, so we get some idea here then that the waters that this harlot is sitting upon represents something and it tells us what it represents it represents people population centers lots of people multitudes and nations and tongues all right so are you getting are you getting a picture here of who this is well we're going to keep pressing forward verse 18 the last verse in the chapter verse 18 Explains further, it says, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Who is it? What system reigns over the kings of the earth? What system is that? Now, let's remember something in Bible prophecy. We are in Bible prophecy, aren't we here? Yes. And so what does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? A church. A church that's right. Could it, is it the true church? Could it, could it be 
a true church or a false church, an apostate church. It could be either one, couldn't it? Depending. All right. Now, can we back that up from the Bible, by the way? Let's do that. It's a good idea to do that, isn't it? If you would like to go back with me to Isaiah 54, Isaiah 54, verse 5 and 6. Isaiah 54, we're going to try to establish from the Bible that a woman can represent a church or God's people, his professed people, whether they are true or not. Okay, Isaiah 54, verse five and, five, verses 5 and 6. And Isaiah 54, five, verses 5 and 6 says, For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Okay, so who is God? God is speaking here. Who is God addressing? The people of Israel, right? That's God's people, his Old Testament church. And he says... He compares himself to the church's husband, the husband. God is the husband. All right. And goes on, says the Lord of hosts is his name and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called for the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth when thou wast refused saith thy God. All right, so there's one verse that helps us to understand that God represents his professed followers, his church, his people, as a woman, as a wife. And he is the husband, okay? Now, go with with me to Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 2. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 2. We want to establish this firmly. So let's look at another verse. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 2. What does a woman represent in Bible prophecy? Jeremiah 6 verse 2 says, I have likened thee to the, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman, or a lovely, beautiful, and delicate woman. So here it says, I have likened the daughter of Zion, in other words, the church, another way of calling God's people his church, I have likened you to a lovely and delicate woman. All right, what about the New Testament? Let's go to 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. And we're going to get some clues as to what that fornication was talking about over there in Revelation. What is all of that about? This, and why is this woman called a harlot or a whore? 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. God speaking here, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So the church is the bride of Christ, is the woman. And so when we go over to Revelation and we see a woman represented there, and we see that that woman is considered a harlot, What does that tell us about this church? This church is an apostate church. It was once married to Christ as as her husband, but now she has found other husbands. Other husbands. Who are those other husbands? Turn with me to 1 Peter 5 and verse 13. We'll get another clue about who Babylon is, Babylon, because this woman has a name we saw in Revelation, and her name is Babylon, Babylon the Great. 
Revelation, I'm, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 13. Now Peter is writing, he's writing to the church. And he's just giving, he's passing his greetings on to them here. But I want to notice, I want you to notice something here. 1 Peter 5, 13. It says, the church that is at where? Babylon. Elected together with you, saluteth you. And so doth Marcus or Mark, my son. So he's passing on his greetings there. So the interesting aspect of this verse is he says that the church at Babylon. Now, when Peter is writing this, this is in the first century uh, after Christ. And the city of Babylon actually is way over there in, in, in uh, Mesopotamia. And it's really not much. There's not much left to that city, that literal city. And so the church at Babylon is actually referring to, and if you go to, if you have a New Living Translation, and you look in there, and you look at the footnote, it will say this. Your sister church in Rome sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. So what does Rome have to do with Babylon? It so happens to be that Christians, Christians saw Babylon as a symbol of apostasy, of idolatry, of those who persecute God's people. And at that time, that was the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire, as you know from history, would give way to... It was the pagan Roman Empire, and in the 476, about the year 476, about that time, the Roman Empire broke up, and you know from our study from the book of Daniel that it broke up into how many kingdoms? Ten, that's right. That's, That's ten horns on the beast. And we see, so we see the ten kingdoms, Basically, Western Europe. And then what happened to all those countries in Western Europe? Those of you who were here this morning with uh, saw our um, mission story, you saw that uh, those the imperial nations of Western Europe basically colonized the entire world. And so you have languages like Spanish, and Portuguese and German being spoken all through Central and South America. And in Africa, you see, and in India and in Southeast Asia, the English and Spanish and, and, and uh, Portuguese and German and various other languages. And they're all European. And so Rome, the influence of those Rome, the breakup of the Roman Empire spread across the entire globe. And to this day, we see that influence there. And so Rome is, as you remember in in the Daniel 2, the metal image. What was the legs of iron or represent? The kingdom, the the, uh, empire of Rome. And then that that was the last empire, wasn't it? it? It broke up into the... Ten divisions, and you have the ten toes there, and the statue. It was a mixture of iron and clay. So we see that the Roman Empire really carries all the way down in one form or another, all the way down to the second coming of Christ. And we also studied in our studies in Daniel that Rome gives way to another influence, a religious influence. And it carried on the Roman Empire essentially through the Bishop of Rome who was elevated to the Pope. And so the papacy, that system then continues to rule over the kings of the earth, especially there in Europe, and have great influence until she receives her deadly wound. Remember that? 
at the end of the 1260 year period. That happened in the year 1798 when Napoleon's general went to Rome, took the Pope prisoner, and he died in exile in France. But in Revelation 13, you remember that he, that he received a deadly wound, but what happened? His deadly wound was healed eventually. And then it says, all the world wondered after the beast. And so we see that this system then will resurrect. And we have seen in our lifetime evidences of that resurrection taking place as the Roman system becomes more and more influential and powerful. And one day it will reign again completely. All right, but so Babylon then is a symbol for this system. But you notice that in Revelation, Babylon is, is a mother. And what does she have? She has daughters, daughters, lots of daughters. And they are also harlots. And so who are the daughters of Rome? The Protestant church, the Protestant churches, those churches that have imbibed the errors and the apostasy of the mother and have committed fornication. They have married a different husband than Christ. We'll look at that here in just a moment. So who is Babylon? Well, in Old Testament times, Babylon is a literal kingdom, isn't it? You know, we remember studying about Babylon in the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar took Daniel and his friends captive. So let's, do, let's just describe some characteristics of Babylon, of literal Babylon there from the book of Daniel, just from the things you remember of your study. We won't go and look at those right now, but we could, but we don't have time. So... Did Babylon rule the then known world back then? Yes, it did. Babylon was pictured as the head of gold. It ruled the then known world in that time. Babylon was one of the great wonders of the ancient world. And it it, it so happens that Babylon, the city of Babylon, sat on many waters. And what does that mean? That means the city of Babylon actually, you know, that was a desert climate. And, but they built the city on top of the river Euphrates. And the Tigris River is not too far away either. And, uh, and the, so they, the city of Babylon with, with beautiful walls, uh, they had this, the river Euphrates right, running right underneath it, right down the middle of it. And so they were able to put Uh, gates in the wall that allowed the water to come through and they could open and close those gates. And uh, so that water being in a desert environment was the life source of Babylon. Now keep that in mind because water represents what in the New Testament in, in the book of Revelation? People. And so people are the life support system of this of this uh, ba- uh, organization of Babylon in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation. All right. Babylon sits on many waters. Now, Babylon persecuted God's people, didn't it? It persecuted God's people. It took Daniel, the, you know, it took Daniel and three Hebrew worthies captive and among many others. Babylon... If you remember there, the story of Babylon there at the plain of Dura, when Nebuchadnezzar set up the golden image, he had representatives from the in all the world come, didn't he? All the leaders from all over the world. And what did he tell you, tell the people there? Did he say, you know, I, I want you to worship this golden image. Uh, if you don't want to, that's okay. But... You know, we, I really would like you to do that. Is that the was there was there any option? No, there was no option. They were told you must fall down and worship the golden image. And what would happen if they did not? Death penalty, death penalty. All right. 
So they, Babylon forced, tried to force the whole world to worship the way it wanted them to worship. And there was a death penalty for those who would not. Does that remind us of a power in Revelation? There is a chapter in Revelation, chapter 13, where there are two beasts. You remember that? There are two beasts. There's one, the beast that comes up out of the sea, and one that comes up out of the earth. And what does the beast that comes up out of the earth do? He forces, tries to force the whole world to worship the first beast. And what is, he, what is, what is, is it optional? No. He says, if you don't worship the first beast, there's a death penalty. And involved in all this is a mark, a mark, the mark of the beast. And so we see some similarities here between Babylon in the Old Testament and this system in the New Testament, in the, in the book of Revelation. Now, think back at the true Babylon, I mean the literal Babylon, I should say, the literal Babylon in the, in the Old Testament. Did they know anything about the true God? Yes, they did. How did they know anything about the true God? Did Nebuchadnezzar know anything about the true God when he had the, when he had the people bow to his golden image? Yes. Where did he get the idea of the golden image even? God had given him a vision, a dream in the night. Remember uh, in, in Daniel chapter 2 of the metal image? And so, and Daniel had interpreted the dream for Nebuchadnezzar. And so the king of Babylon and Babylon itself knew about the true God. And they, and, and, and notice something here, that when Nebuchadnezzar set up that golden image, was there, was there, was that pure error? Absolutely no truth in, in what he was presenting there? No, it was partly true because he had seen that, he had seen a vision of a statue like that in his vision that God gave him. The head of gold, was that true? Was that true to God's vision? Yes, it was. But what was the rest of it? So what we see then is that we see that Babylon, literal Babylon, mixes some of God's truth and then takes it, changes it a little bit, and adapts it to the pagan worship. And so we see a mixture of truth and error together. That is a hallmark of Babylon, literal Babylon in the Old Testament. What about in the New Testament? What about in the book of Revelation? We see there, then, that this system takes forms of worship that are true and mixes it together and serves it up to the people of the world to drink as the wine of Babylon. The wine of Babylon. And what does the wine of Babylon do to the people of the world? It makes them drunk, doesn't it? Why is it? Because that wine is no longer the pure grape juice. It has become fermented. It has become poisoned with error. Error. So it's a mixture of truth and false. This fermented wine causes the people to become drunk. It intoxicates them. And what happens when you become intoxicated? Can you think clearly? Can you study your Bibles and come away with the pure truth while you're drinking, uh, intoxicated? It's pretty difficult, isn't it? It much, much more difficult to do that. And so if it were nice, pure grape juice, it would be fine. But this wine causes the world to be drunk. And so with Babylon, with the Babylon in Revelation, it perhaps started out as pure. It started out as, a, as God's true church. 
But something happens. It becomes spoiled and fermented. And what their teachings actually become harmful. Now, what does the word Babylon mean? The word Babylon? It's, yeah, confusion. That's right. It means confusion. Now, to the Babylonians, what did it mean? I'm sure it didn't mean confusion to them. Uh, It had to mean something else, and, and indeed it did. It meant gate of the gods. Gate of the gods. It was the gateway to all the gods of the world. You could have all the gods you wanted. And there were many, many gods and many, many lords. And so Babylon, it's a perfect fit, isn't it? Confusion, confusion of teachings, all kinds of teachings. Truth and error mixed together, causing people to be confused. You remember the Tower of Babel? Many languages. What what happened there at the Tower of Babel? The people of the world gathered together and they built the first city on earth. And they defied God and they built a tower to protect themselves. In other words, to save themselves against a flood even though God had promised never to send another flood again. So right there it shows that they mistrusted God. They did not trust God. They did not take him at his word. And they said, we're going to go ahead and we're going to build a way to save ourselves. And so they built this tower up towards God, up towards heaven. But it was a way to save themselves. Not God's way but their own way. Is that a clue as to how Babylon in a spiritual sense does? Yes. Trying to work their way to heaven using man's methods. So God confounded them. He confused their languages so they could not communicate. And so Babylon signifies a confusion. What do we see in the system of Babylon in the book of Revelation? Again, the confusion. It is a conglomeration of differing viewpoints, confusing Babel of voices, a collection of many churches and denominations believing differently on key doctrines and teachings. And yet, Babylon comes together in an ecumenical, universal, false unity and false worship. So in the Old Testament, Babylon was a literal kingdom and a great city that opposed God's true people. And God does something with Babylon. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 51. Jeremiah chapter 51. And we're going to see that in the Old Testament, something literal happened But then we're going to see this almost word for word in the book of Revelation. Almost. Or very, very similar ideas. So look with me at Jeremiah chapter 51. Jeremiah was a prophet in the time of Daniel. Remember, Daniel actually mentions Jeremiah. Daniel the prophet was studying the prophet Jeremiah. In, Jerem- in Daniel verse, uh, chapter 9. But we're going to look at Jeremiah chapter 51 here, beginning in verse 1. Jeremiah 51 and verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up against Babylon and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me a destroying wind. All right, so the subject here is Babylon. This is literal Babylon. This is in the time when Babylon was at its peak power. And go with me down to verse 6. What does God instruct his people to do regarding Babylon? Verse 6. Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. 
be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken her wine, therefore the nations are mad. Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. Howl for her, take balm for her pain, if so be she may be healed. Verse 9, we would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her, and let us go every one into his own country, for her judgment reacheth unto heaven, and is lifted up even to the skies. Notice here, God is talking about literal Babylon, and he's t he urges his people to flee out of Babylon, to leave, to come out, and says that the earth has been made drunken with the wine of Babylon. And it says that Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. And it says we would have healed Babylon. But does Babylon accept that healing? No. It says she is not healed. Forsake her. Let us go, everyone, into our own country. Now go with me to the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation. We want to read something similar. Do you recognize some things here? We've read some things in Revelation where Babylon was fallen, is fallen, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And here we see Babylon. In the book of Revelation, let's go to Revelation 17, verse 18. We read this earlier, but we'll just review it, review it quickly and then move into the next chapter. Revelation 17 and verse 18, talking about Babylon here, this woman, this harlot woman which has the word Babylon, named Babylon, written on her forehead, says, The woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. This system, this religious system, this apostate Christianity that rules over the kings of the earth, that influences the kings of the earth, this is what this is talking about. This highly organized, integrated association of human beings Represented as a city, a great city. Babylon the Great, it is called. And it has influence on the kings of the earth. Well, let's go to Revelation 18. Revelation 18, beginning in verse 1. Here is the call. Here is the call. Revelation 18, verse 1. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Notice this. This angel comes down from heaven. So this is coming from God. This message is from God. And this message is really important because this angel is said to have great power. And it says that the earth was lightened with the glory of this angel, of this message. So this is a phenomenal situation going on here. Going on verse, the next verse, it says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, 
and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. There it is. This is the ultimate and the final call of revelation to the people of the earth. This is the very last message. This is the last opportunity for the inhabitants of the earth. And who is this message directed to? It is directed to God's people. God's people. And where are God's people pictured? These particular uh, part of God's people, where are they pictured as being in? Babylon. They are in this system, this apostate false religion that is making the world drunk with his teachings. And God calls them out. And people, you, some people might say, well, well I, would like to, I would like to stay there and maybe I can convert my friends and, and change them and maybe we can change Babylon and, and reform it and, and, and maybe Babylon would be healed. But what did Jeremiah say? Babylon, what would happen to Babylon? Would it be healed? No. Forsake her. She would not be healed. And so the call goes out. Come out of her. It's judgment time. God is going to destroy it. And the whole rest of this chapter 18 is about the destruction of Babylon. The final, full, complete destruction of this system of apostasy. And so God gives one last opportunity to his people. Come out of her, my people. It is the most urgent appeal in the entire Bible. And it is a message that I believe is being sounded today for you and me and for anyone who might be caught up in this system. It is a call for God's people to come out of Babylon, that twice fallen system of error. Why? Because her sins have reached up to heaven. And Babylon is a mother. She has daughters. These daughters, these harlots, they're pictured as harlots, have committed spiritual adultery. What is this spiritual adultery talking about? Go with me over to James chapter 4 and verse 4. What is this spiritual adultery or fornication talking about here? Now, James 4 and verse 4. There are several aspects of it that we could talk about, but this is one of them. James 4 and verse 4. And the Bible here is speaking to the church, to God's people. And it addresses them as ye adulterers and adulteresses. Now, that's not a very flattering way to address somebody, is it? But yet, God's word is addressing his people and calling them adulterers and adulteresses. Why? Going on, it says, Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Amen. So, Babylon and this false apostate religion, this false Christianity, is friendly to the world. Not in the sense that Jesus was friendly with the world, not in the sense of trying to save the world, but they're friendly with the world in the way of joining with them in their culture, in their way of talking, in their, the music they listen to, the movies they watch, the way they dress, the food they eat, and all the other things about life. They have taken on the philosophy of the world. 
and then brought that into the church. Idolatry, the false Sabbath, all kinds of things. It's a long list. And we saw and we've seen through history the sad tale of what has happened to God's true church when it tried to bring, convert the world and bring the world into the church. Actually, the church was converted to the world. And the long, dark ages was the result of that. And so God had to call out a new movement. The Protestants, the Protestant movement. And then even they did not stay up with truth. And they did not accept all of God's truth. And God had to call another, move, another group, another movement out of that. In the mid-1800s, we saw that, the Advent movement and the keeping of the true Sabbath, the seventh-day Sabbath, and the teaching on the truth about what happens when a person dies, and the truth about hellfire, the truth about the second coming of Christ, and so many other truths that God has restored to the remnant church of the end times. But he calls his people to come out of that apostate system and into his true church. Our, our text this morning that we read, uh, the scripture reading, 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17. We don't have to turn there, but it says this. You're familiar with it. It says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So God is calling for his people to come out of the world. He says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So you see, God calls his faithful people who are trapped in Babylon, who don't know any better or are, 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 are being held back by family pressures or jobs uh, pressures or, or, or other, other things that are holding them back. God calls for them to break free from that, to separate from the worldliness, from the false religion, from the Babylonian system of error, and to come out and be part of the pure woman, the pure church. And let's go and look at the pure church in Revelation. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. There's several descriptions of the, of the pure woman. You know, there's two women in the book of Revelation. There's the pure church and the apostate church. Revelation 19, 7 and 8 says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints, or the righteous deeds of the saints. And so we see here, that the true woman, the true church, is making herself ready to be married to the Lamb. And she is clothed in pure, white, fine linen, clean and white, the righteousness of Christ, which becomes the righteousness of the saints. And in Revelation 12, 17, a familiar verse, we read this last week, Revelation 12, 17, The dragon is very angry at this true church. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we see here that the true woman, the true church, is keeping the commandments of God it is a small remnant. 
that are following God's commandments. And they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. These are the ones who receive the seal of God, talked about in Revelation chapter 7. And they receive God's seal. We talked about this last week, what God's seal is, right there in the middle of the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment, the Sabbath, containing the seal of God, His name, His title, His authority, His jurisdiction, the Lord God, Creator of heavens and earth, the sea and all that in them is. It represents the true God. This is the seal of God. And this is in contrast to those in Babylon who receive the mark of the beast. So the issue is over worship and over obedience. Who will we worship? Who will we obey? The commandments of God or the traditions of man? And so it comes down to what day we worship on. Will we worship God and keep day, the sacred, the day that he has told us to keep all the way through the Bible from cover to cover? Or will we keep a day that man has substituted, that Rome has substituted in place of God's commandment? A day that honors the Son the greatest God in the Roman system, in all the apostate systems of worship, the sun God is the most powerful because the sun brings us life. And so we worship not the creator, but the created. Worshiping on the day of the sun. So God calls us to make a decision, receive the seal of God, the character of God in our foreheads, or receive the mark of the beast and his character, his way of doing things. And God calls us, he calls us to leave that system, that apostate system, and to come into his true remnant church. You know, Jesus said in John 10, 16, he says, the, uh, he says, there are other sheep out there. He says, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be, how many folds? One fold and one shepherd. When this thing ends... God is going to have all of his true and faithful people out of all those other folds, all of those other false systems of worship. He's going to bring them all into one body, one church, his remnant church that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. They are the sealed of God. They refuse to worship the beast, the true and faithful remnant do. They refuse to go along with the image of the beast. They refuse to receive his number or his name. They refuse to be deceived by the spirits of demons who have gone out to the earth to deceive the kings of the earth. They refuse to be intimidated by the dragon or Satan as he goes to war against the remnant. They refuse to be discouraged by their small numbers, even though it is a small minority. They are walking the narrow way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. And so they refuse to receive the mark of the beast. They refuse to worship anyone or anything other than God and all that he commands. They refuse to follow the traditions of man in place of God. In fact, instead of compromising with Babylon, they instead live according to the Bible and the Bible only as their only rule of faith and practice. And they follow the Lamb wherever he leads them. They hear the call of God to separate from Babylon 
and they obey that call. And they don't waste time sitting on the fence. These faithful hear God's call in the book of Revelation to come out of Babylon. You remember the story of Lot and his family. They're living there in that wicked city of Sodom. Now, there was plenty of merchandise in the city of Sodom, plenty of goods and plenty of trading. They had a good economy. They were buying and selling, lots of entertainment. It was a good, lot, <clears throat> good life. The weather was good. There were palm trees and gardens. It was a beautiful place to live. Everyone had their own swimming pool in their backyards, perhaps. Lots of good theaters. They had nice temples to worship in. But the city was wicked. Her sins had reached up to heaven. And judgment time had come. The people did not realize that. But God still had some faithful people there in Sodom. And so he called them out. The message was urgent. It was an emergency situation. There was no time to waste. Every minute, every minute counted. But God wanted to save as many as he could. So he delayed it for a short time. But at last he urgently called his people to come out of her. And so Lot and his family answered that call. Finally, at last. And yet, some of them even had lingering doubts. Remember Lot's wife? Even as she left Sodom, where was her heart? It was still back in Sodom. And she looked back. And we know what happened to her. What about you and me? Are we answering the call of Revelation? Are we leaving behind all that pertains to Sodom or to Babylon? Or is there still a little bit of Babylon left in us? God calls us to leave Babylon, spiritually speaking, to leave behind that system of error, the attitude, the way of life, the teachings, to come out and be separate. He wants to change our hearts so that we no longer have Babylon in our hearts. And he promises to give us forgiveness and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, he came to save us from our sins, to give us a new life, a new mind, new directions, and new purposes and goals and aspirations. He wants us to leave behind the old and embrace the new, the way of life. And he tells us, I call heaven and earth, just like in Deuteronomy, he said there in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. And you remember in the Old Testament, Joshua asked the people of Israel a question that we should ask ourselves as well. Whom will you serve? Joshua 24, 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Will you and I heed the call of revelation? Will we obey God's last call? And will we give that call to others so that they can make that choice as well? Whom will you serve?